O thou who hearest prayer. Scriptures are not wrong, you know. I always see all the scriptures dramatized before my eyes. I don't just read the Bible. I see them all dramatized before my eyes. That is another powerful gift, powerful arena, realm that you can enter into where all the living words that you read in your Bible becomes real drama before your eyes. And you can actually be in all those events to see everything enacted as it really was, which you don't read in the Bible. Anyway, so he prayed for everybody and then he said, Lord Jesus, please speak to me. And the Lord Jesus opened his mouth and he said, in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. And he got up and he rushed off the home to work. And the Lord Jesus turned and looked at me and he said, Now do you see what I meant when I said the problem is not with me, the problem is with him. Then the Lord Jesus said, The problem is my people have no time to wait on me. They expect me to operate like an instant noodle. Instant noodles. Uh, do you all know what is Maggie noodles? No, that's why. You know noodles? You tear the packet, you drop into the water, in the two minutes it's cooked and ready to eat. If I was praying for an American, maybe the Lord would, would have told me, my people expect me to behave like a TV dinner. You take out from the fridge, put it in the microwave, and in two minutes, all ready to be eaten. It doesn't work like that. This is where we have lost a great heritage. What is that heritage? The ability to talk face to face with your father. Tell me one thing, my dear brothers and sisters. What kind of a child is a child if it cannot see its father's face? What kind of a child is a child? What kind of a child is a child if it cannot hear the father's voice? What kind of a child is a child? You know, a child that is born out of wedlock is called a bastard. Am I right? The English dictionary says like that. I'm not using a swear word or a curse word. So, a child who doesn't know who the father is, society calls it a bastard. This is what I prayed. Lord, how can I be a child of God if I cannot see my father's face? Then I'm not a son of God. Then I'm a bastard. This was my quest. I prayed and prayed and prayed and pressed on. Every day I will say like this. He who seeks, he shall find. So, God desires to talk to us. But we must come to a position where we wait on God for him to talk to us. If you rush through your five-minute devotional or through your quick fix methods of hearing God, you will never, never reach the place of really being one with God. You know, I have not come here to entertain you or teach you or preach to you like what is popularly taught everywhere. All these ABCs or one, two, threes, how to get there or come out here. I am teaching you the very manna that the Lord Jesus Christ has taught me, which I have learned at the feet of the Master, that many times will not add up to what your charismatic theology says. Because charismatic theology says, name it and claim it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. God is not in the lottery business. 
Do you have this game called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It was a big hit in India, you know. <laughs> so once, one man called me for prayer. He said, Brother, please pray for me. I said, All right, what shall I pray? Next week, I'm appearing in that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire program. <laughs> so please pray that an angel of the Lord will stand beside me and speak into my ear all the answers so that I can walk away with a million dollars. So I told him, that's a good request. You know, I myself need a million dollars for my ministry. So instead of praying for you, I can pray for myself. I can participate in that game and I can walk away with a million dollars. God doesn't work like that. How nice it will be if it works like that. Right? You'll all be millionaires. It doesn't work like that. Remember what I told you last night. God hates laziness. God hates laziness. He who does not work is not fit to eat. That's what is, the Bible says. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, it is the absolute desire of God that the bride of Christ if you want to be the bride of Christ, learn how to wait on God so that you can be exchanged to be made something new. Now, what is waiting on God? We need to define what is waiting on God so that you'll get some understanding what it's all about. In the Hebrew language, four different words are used to convey the concept of waiting. Now when we put all these four words together, then we can understand a complete picture what it means to wait on God. Firstly, is the word Daman. D-A-M-A-N. And the word Daman means to stand still. Psalms 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. God is always standing before us, you know. The Bible says, where there are two or three gathered, I am there in your midst. Do you know that scripture? Now there are more than three people here. According to the scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ is in our midst. Everybody agrees? Yes. But do you see? No, why not? Now, there is a problem. Why not? If that scripture is true, then we should be able to see. The scripture of God is not a lie. Agreed everybody? So if the scripture is true, we are not able to see, then something is wrong with us. The problem is, we have not become still. Be still and know that I am God. When you become still, then you shall know the Lord who is standing in front of you. Secondly, is the word Damiya. D-U-M-I-Y-A-H. And the word Damiya means to wait in silence. Psalm 62, verse 1. You don't make all the noise. Most of our problem is we make all the noise and God cannot talk to us. If you want God to talk to you, Keep quiet or shut up. <laughs> now you understand better. We must learn that. Thirdly, is the word Chawa. Q A V A H. It means gathered together in oneness. Be gathered together in oneness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9 it says, and God gathered all the waters in one place. Be gathered together in oneness. Now later on I'll explain to you one by one what it all means. Fourthly is the word Chaka. C-H-A-K-A-H -H. it means to wait earnestly with a loving anticipation. Psalms 130 verse 6. 
So, to wait on God means to stand still, to wait in silence, to be gathered together in oneness, and to wait earnestly with a loving expectation. Now, we put all these four different definitions together, and I came up with one simple definition. That will give us a bone or a meat to chew. To wait on God means, is to wait earnestly in silence and stillness in God's presence and seeking to be bound in a perfect union of intimate bonding with the Lord Jesus Christ. Understood everybody? <laughs> Did it sound Greek to you? No. All right, I'll give you a simplified version. It means, staying in God's presence and seeking to be bound in a perfect union of intimacy. Is it clearer now? Okay. Now, turn with me to John chapter 15. I'm going to show you some mysteries in that passage of scripture. And this was how the Lord Jesus Christ, when he appeared like the mighty eagle, explained this passage of scripture to me. John chapter 15, verse 5 and 7. I am the wine, you are the branches. He that abided in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, we can do nothing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now please observe, the one word that was repeatedly used in these two scripture is the word abide. Now please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let us look at verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now, I'm going to take you a little deeper into the mysteries in this two scripture. Just open your heart with me. Then you will understand this concept of what it means to wait on the Lord. Now we take John chapter 15 verse 5 and 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 and you put them together. It is this. When you come and wait before God, all that is within you becomes one with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you abide in the presence of God, all that is within you is bound in oneness with the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are bound in oneness, a powerful manifestation of translation takes place. I will explain that to you in deeper in another session. But this is how the Lord Jesus Christ explained to me. When you abide, when you wait in His holy presence, you are bound, you are joined with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you will permit me, I can explain this to you in a more frank and open manner that will give you a better understanding. Why does the Bible say sexual sins is a worse sin among all other sins? Because it is during the act of sex that when the male organ is in the woman's body, the female's body, that act, flesh becomes one, two flesh becomes one. It's a blood covenant that is made at that moment of time. The bone becomes one, two bones becomes one, and two fleshes becomes one flesh. In the union of the sexual act, the two becomes one. They are bounded in one. They are not two, in two different places having a, se a sexual act. They must come together in oneness. During that moment, the two souls become one, the two spirits become one, 
the two minds don't think of anything else, but they are only thinking of one union, that oneness, that act. You see, the sexual pleasures that you can receive from that act is a parabolic, minutest ecstasy that a person can receive when they wait on God. Are you offended by my this simple frank? But this was how the Lord Jesus explained to me. Now in the natural I don't have these experiences because the Lord called me to be a celibate life. But this was how the Lord appeared before me and explained to me that when a husband and wife come in union, the pleasure of ecstasy they enjoy is a parable of a physical thing that conveys the larger spiritual ecstasy that takes place when the, our spirit is joined with the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having said all, now I put a danger before you. The last day's remnant are going to face a similar test of allegiance. When the Antichrist is here, Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 17 says, you will be given a choice to take the mark of the beast or you are beheaded. You cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. All the credit cards that you have today will migrate towards a chip in your hand or chip on your forehead. So what will you do? Are you going to stuff and die? Or are you going to say, God understands my heart. My flesh, only the flesh is taking the mug, not my heart. I tell you one truth. There will be millions of Christians who will do that. Who, who will deceive themselves because there will there will be a group of preachers who will teach their congregation that. It's okay. It's all right. God understands. He knows the flesh is, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He knows. He knows all that. So go ahead. Take it. No, nothing wrong. I'll tell you one very shocking story. A dear friend of mine, a wonderful minister of God, had lunch with the elder of the largest church in Singapore. And during lunch, somehow the topic came about the mark of the beast. And the elder said this, nothing wrong taking the mark of the beast. This minister friend of mine was shocked, his jaw dropped. He said, what do you mean? Yes, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. And the church that he attends, he's one of the important elders in the church, is famous for hyper-grace doctrine. That pastor is very famous in the US. 
So can you imagine the belief that was in the elder is what 33,000 believers believe in the church. Or maybe not, if not all the 33,000, at least a larger percentage. And that will be a similar concept among the seeker friendly churches and the hyper grace because anything goes in the hyper grace because according to the hyper grace doctrine all your sins past present future all have been forgiven on the cross so even your future sins that you will do all are taken care of so no matter how much you fornicate don't worry just go ahead because it's all been done away on the cross you can fornicate you can live a homosexual life, you can live a lesbian life, you can do all kind of evil. Don't worry, in the sweet, by and by, you'll all go to heaven. Do you believe that? No. That is the filth that's been preached. And many churches, one after another, are now adopting this doctrine. And I was shocked to read the other day in one of a popular uh, minister's magazine that there's this minister who goes around conducting successful church growth seminars. And one of the, his, one of the most important point that he makes in his lecture to grow the church is don't preach Jesus. Yes. That's what he said, don't preach Jesus. Make your church look like a discotheque. Take away all these things. Put all these colored lights. Make it look like a rock and roll concert. Remove away this keyboard. Remove away the drum. Come on. Make it look like it's not a church. Because you scare people away. People of God, you take away Jesus, what church is there? What message is there anymore? There's no message anymore. Right? It's because of the Lord Jesus we all are gathered here. You take away that Jesus factor. Why are we here? Right? But that's what been preached today. So all this kind of folks are the first ones to queue to take the mark. So you will be forced. Some of your family members, your relatives, even your church members will have taken the mark. And you will be the oddball. You will be the only turkey who has not taken the mark yet. And you're going to starve to death. You know, you can control your hunger. What about your baby? What about your little children? How much can they control, Brittany? Your baby, what will happen to your babies? Are, they, are you going to allow them to starve to death? You won't. Then you will take the mark. Then they're going to starve and die. Ah, see? You know, I always ask this question to many mothers. When I ask the mothers, they said, yes, we will stand strong. Then when I post them about your babies, they suddenly keep quiet. Now, that's been practical. You will be forced to make a decision. Right, Brittany? You'll be forced. Whether are you going to see your babies cry to death? And you tell your baby, don't worry, baby. Don't worry, darling. Don't worry. Little while you'll die, we'll meet in heaven. Can you say that? See, she has no answer now. It'll be very difficult, isn't it? That is why the Lord Jesus said, Woe unto those who have babies. Nursing baby and thoughtless in those days because that will be your temptation.
what are you going to do? That's why the Lord told me, train the children to be martyrs. Train them. So for the last five years, we have a program on Angel TV called Warriors, where I personally teach a bunch of children what it means to be a martyr. So we go through the scriptures, I teach them stories about the lives of many martyrs. And through that program over the last five years, an army of children has been raised all over the world who are not afraid to be a martyr when the time comes. Amen. When I was in Nigeria last week, there was these 400 kids who came to our children's prophetic camp. And every one of them, they put, when I walked in on the last day, they came running to say, oh, we are warriors. They shout like what I do in the program, and they say, we are all martyrs, little ones. You know, let me tell you this true incident that took place in Syria. There was this family, a Christian family, father, mother, two children. One day this woman was praying, and the Lord asked her, my dear daughter, will you put yourselves on the altar for me? And she understood what it meant. She said, she knelt down, she said, yes, Lord, I give my life to you, I put it on the altar. Two days later, the Lord spoke to her, my dear daughter, Will you put your husband on the altar for me? So she kept quiet because now it involves the husband. So she stopped praying. She went and talked with the husband. And the husband without second thought said, Honey, let's kneel down and pray. So they held hands together and they committed themselves on the altar for the Lord. Three days later, as she was praying, the Lord spoke to her, My dear daughter, can you put your children on the altar for me? She stood up, jumped out from her chair, because she has two beautiful children, little ones, eight and six. So adorable, like as if angels personified in flesh. She, for a week, she didn't know what to do. Finally, after one week, during their morning devotion, father, mother, and the two girls, she carried the girls and she put on her lap and she told them, Darling, sometime bad evil men would may come budging to our house. And when you see that, close your eyes real tight. You will hear them shouting, Will you renounce Jesus? And daddy will say, No. And then suddenly you will hear, Pop! A bo daddy's body drop. Don't open your eyes. Keep it real sharp. Then after that you will hear the man come to mummy and say, Will you renounce Jesus? And you will hear mummy say, No. And you will hear some, don't open your eyes. Hold your sister's hand real tight. Shut your eyes real tight. Then after some time, you'll feel a sharp sword on your neck. Open your eyes and look at the man who's standing before you. And you tell him, I forgive you for killing my parents and Jesus loves you. This is what the mother told the little children. And the two little cherubic girls look at the mother, and the mother asked them, do you understand? They just nod their head. So the whole family knelt down. They prayed. They committed themselves, laying themselves on the altar for the Lord. A week later, as they were getting ready in the morning to go to work and go to school, the door was kicked open. And Four ISIS terrorists entered into their house. And whatever the mother said to the children a week earlier, all came to pass, one by one. And these two girls, the older girl felt a sharp knife on her neck. 
She opened her eyes, she saw a hooded terrorist. And she said, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Entire family. This is a true incident that happened in Syria not too long ago. The whole family became martyrs. And the two children did not deny their faith because the parents prepared them. You must prepare your children. Not only you should end up in heaven, your young, your youth children, your little ones, they all should come into the kingdom of God. No one should take the mark of the beast. Because the Bible says, whether you take it willingly or unwillingly, all those who take the mark of the beast are condemned forever. Condemned forever. Of course, the Antichrist will, will force you, but he will not forcibly stamp on your feet, on your head. You will still exercise your will to do it. That is why the Lord called me to do this conference called the Moses Conference. We did it in April and we are going to do another one in September 9, 10, and 11 during the Rosh Hashanah in Singapore. And the theme of the conference is remember the law of Moses to prepare the way so you must remember, because the law of Moses, the Ten, Co the Ten Commandments, is the test that's going to come in these last days. That's the test. The Antichrist or God, which you choose. So prepare, prepare your household. Today, during peace times, Strengthen your faith. Because when the war begins, you will not get the time. We will be on the run. How are you going to fast and pray? You will you'll always be forced to fast. Where are you going to look for preachers? You cannot find anybody. There won't be any TV ministries, no radio ministries, no internet, nothing. You cannot even communicate with one another. When you're running in the wilderness, there's no charging point in the desert. That is why you must learn to build a good relationship with God so that God can talk to you directly. And you talk to God directly. And just as he spoke from heaven for three million Israelites to hear and see, you will have the same experience. God from heaven will talk to you directly. That is why God raised up men like Bobby Conner and other people who are freely sharing their spiritual encounters. Not for you to just be awed by those experiences, but for you to know that these are real and you too can experience them. So that when you experience them, you know these are real. Because these men of God have already shared the experiences. When the lion of Judah comes up to you, yeah. you will not run away thinking it's the devil who's coming because you will have the gift of discerning of spirits to know which lion is this lion. Yes. That is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That when an angel appears before you, some of the angels that have been kept in secret till today, you do not know how they look like. If I describe to you, you will be shocked how they look like, they will be released. The one that you read in the Bible with four heads, six wings. Those are just a few samples in the Bible. There are many more which are not written in the scriptures. I have seen some of them. There's one angel I saw with multi colors on his wings, multi colors. And the rope they wear, multi colors. And they, they have. Eight wings. There's some with 12 wings. 
So if you meet any one of them, are you going to say, I rebuke you, Satan? <laughs> you know, people have done that in the past. In the last days, the veil that is separating the spiritual realm and the natural realm will be so thin that everybody will see them, especially the remnant. Because you need the help of this heavenly army to survive the last days. You need them. And God will release them, permit them to come. The spirits of just men made perfect. They are not only in heaven. There are many, many of them alive on earth till today. Some of them, I know one, is 2,000 years old. There's another one I know of, I've never met, is 400 years old. I wrote, I wrote a book called The Maharishi of Mount Kailash. And he is just one of the many. These are what the Bible calls the mighty ones who are kept in hiding. And the scripture says, let the mighty ones arise. You can read that in Joel chapter 3. These are the in the night bass drops we ignite hearts racing take flight universe in our sight electric dreams collide boom toss and full bloom chanting loud enter the room feel the metals boom cake pop crazy on repeat rhythm fire step your feet a chance burning in the heat let's collide let's meet drums pounding through our veins Breaking all our chains Dog step, rain no pains We're the rulers of these plains Rhythm fire, stick your feet, a 
Hear the music take you away 